What's up guys and welcome back to the best PC you could build. No wait, that's not right. Welcome to something completely new and different. No, that's not right either. Welcome to my monthly build series for February 2017. The video formerly known as the best PC you could build. So as you guys are probably aware, it's been a while since I've done one of these videos. In my channel update, which you could find right up here, I discussed several changes that were being made to the channel, one of which was the renaming of my monthly build video. This is a completely cosmetic change. The meat and potatoes of these videos is remaining exactly the same. Now it feels like forever since I've done one of these, but in reality, I only took January off. And in the time between then and now, holy cow, have we gotten a whole bunch of hardware news and product releases. This will be my first monthly build video using KV Lake, and given the huge news dropping from AMD just a few days ago, it's likely gonna be my last one for at least a month or two while we explore all that the AM4 platform has to offer. Let me know down in the comments if you think I should alternate between Intel and AMD in the coming months to try to balance it out some. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of this build. What will we be doing for our first KB Lake system? Well, let's start out with the case because I think that actually governs a lot of the decisions for the rest of the build. I reviewed the Enermax Steelwing case in this video up here, and I was impressed both by its build quality and intrigued to build in such a different looking enclosure. I'm gonna be trying to match this slightly funky red the best I can using the RGB functionality of some of the other components we have here. Similarly, my review of the ASUS ROG Strix Z270i gaming motherboard last week made me anxious to squeeze this board into a system as soon as possible. It's gonna be the perfect complement to this rig as the Z270 chipset and ASUS's power delivery has already proven itself to be able to power some significant overclocks. And the color neutral color scheme and RGB accent lighting will allow us to be all matchy matchy through the tinted glass side panel. <sighs> all right. As with our review video, the Intel i7-7700K will fit nicely in the LGA1151 socket. This is the top end of the KB Lake product stack, and it's currently Intel's flagship mainstream processor. It features four cores and eight total threads with a boost clock of 4.5 gigahertz. It seems that I may have hit the proverbial silicon lottery with this particular chip as I've managed to crank the frequency up to 5300 megahertz at 1.4 volts and been completely stable in the EVGA Z270 classified. I don't think we'll be hitting quite those numbers in this system, but expect maybe a little bit of an overclock depending on how our cooling goes. Providing the graphics horsepower will be EVGA's brand new GTX 1070 SC2 graphics card. This is the ICX version of the incredibly popular 1070 Superclocked and features radically redesigned cooling on not only the GPU die itself, but also the memory modules and the VRMs. The fans are individually controllable through the Precision X software. And even though my full review video is still in the works, I can tell you that I had this GPU overclocked with a 120 megahertz offset and was running Unigen in heaven on a continuous loop for 30 minutes with temperatures not exceeding 50 degrees Celsius. That's a crazy low number that was achieved on an open air test bench, but that's a full 20 degrees cooler than the ACX version. I'm excited to see that cooling performance translate to real world lower temperature. Now G-Skill's RGB Trident Z memory at 3000 megahertz will slot right into the two dim slots of the Strix motherboard. This is some of the most overclockable memory I've tested so far. And even though G-Skill has unfortunately delayed their RGB control software, we should actually be able to use the ASUS R Sync software to control the five LED zones on the top of the dims. As far as storage goes, I wanted to make sure that we're allowing as much airflow as possible in this case, as space is already at a premium. Consequently, we won't be using a 3.5 inch spinning disc, even though there is a mount for one in this case. Instead, we'll be sticking to all flash storage. Patriot was awesome enough to supply our storage for this build, which will house our Windows install on their blazing fast Hellfire M.2 NVMe SSD, and our media files on the Ignite 2.5 inch SSD. Both the Hellfire and the Ignite are among the absolute fastest drives on the market for their respective product segments, so expect load times to be virtually non-existent. Now, given that this case is configured differently than many others, there is a very real height restriction on the CPU cooler. I've chosen to go with the CryoRig C7, a unit specifically designed for build just like this. It's only 47 millimeters in height and sports a 92 millimeter fan with heat dissipation capabilities of 100 watts. 
It should be sufficient to keep our 7700K reasonably chilly if we're not pushing too high of an overclock. Now, powering everything is another product Enermax was generous enough to send over, the SFX Revolution 550. This is a fully modular unit, which is especially important when there is absolutely no room for error when cable managing in a small case like this. I have the utmost confidence that it won't skip a beat while juicing up our gaming. So you guys have watched me talk for long enough. Let's haphazardly throw things together, plug it all up and see if it works. Right, guys so we are all done with this build and it was interesting I have to say building in this small of a case is something that I've never done before uh, I ran into let's say more 
issues than I thought I was going to. The cable management just, just did not work out. Uh, I know that there's no room for it as far as putting it behind the tray or anything like that, but I was kind of hoping to be able to maybe zip tie some stuff, uh, maybe bundle together with some Velcro or something along those lines and make it look maybe sort of presentable, but it just didn't happen. And that's all right. That's, that's kind of what we knew we were getting into here. But the more interesting thing that happened and something that I think is worth talking about is that I always love it when builds come together smoothly, no issues, they perform great. Uh, I mean, that's the goal, right? But for the purposes of this channel, it's almost kind of better when they don't. And that was the case, unfortunately, here. So because of the very severe size restrictions on the height uh, of the CPU cooler that we could use, uh, the Cryo Rig C7 fit our needs. Um, you know, I actually made sure before ordering it that it was the right height and that it provided sufficient cooling capacity for our chip. Unfortunately, that didn't seem to be the case. I was running at mid 80s most of the time uh, on this chip. There was just no airflow inside of this case. Uh, I think that the power supply being mounted right in front of the fan obviously had a lot to do with that. And the fact that there's only one case fan at all, and it was kind of blowing air directly into a, a very, a fairly dense bundle of cables. I think that the CPU cooling solution was severely choked for air here. And um, I would recommend if somebody were to be building in this case, cause I, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's the case's fault. Like you go into it knowing this case is small and that your cooling is going to be restricted. So I can't say that this is the fault of Enermax. So, but you have to know that there are severe restrictions on what you could do in here and you have to plan accordingly. And I think something like 120 millimeter AIO would probably be a lot more appropriate for a case like this. I think that it would work out a lot better. And I think that you'd be able to sufficiently cool your processor and just stick that that single 120 right in the front, right where that red fan is. But what happened with us, with me, uh, is that the, I, first of all, overclocking was out of the question. And secondly, even when I was just gaming, uh, I was seeing temperatures spike all the way up to 100 degrees. And when that happens with Intel CPUs, they throttle. And I was getting, I was looking at some charts for um, when I was running benchmarks. And I'm sure you noticed that the benchmark scores for the system are below where you would expect them to be, especially for some of the gaming benchmarks. Now, the GPU, the, uh, the EVGA SuperClock 2 1070 uh, was fine. I mean, it was running, I guess, a little bit warmer than normal because of, like I said, there's not a lot of airflow in that case, but that ICX cooler did a hell of a job of keeping the GPU nice and cool relatively anyway that was not the problem the problem was that when the utilization for the cpu went up to 100 so did the temperatures and so the cpu utilization would be at 100 and then it would it would crash it would just crater down to like 20 or 30 and it would stay down there until temps normalized and then it would go back up so the that the, the cpu not being able to maintain a stable boost was and and actually hamstringing itself to so as not to cause damage from overheating caused a severe bottleneck when it came to feeding uh, information to the GPU to process. So that means that we have much lower gaming benchmarks than we normally would with a 1070 and a 7700K. So you know, I, I at first I was really puzzled by this, I, was, I didn't know what was going on because the results I was getting from the tests were pretty poor considering. But you know, after a little bit of investigation and the fact that I could pull up some graphs in um, MSI Afterburner to watch the, actually what was going on with the temperatures of all the units as well as the utilization and the clock speeds, it became pretty obvious that you know, when the, when the CPU was being taxed really heavily, all of a sudden there was just a crash in frame rates. So, I mean, that, that explains it. I mean, and I reseeded the cooler because I was so concerned about what was going on. 
reapplied the thermal paste, it didn't make a difference. Uh, there's just no air. There's no air in the case. Um, so an AIO is what you got to go with if you're going to build in this case. But I think that this is this is a little bit more advanced than maybe um, some other cases that I've built in. It's, this requires a good amount of expertise. And hell, I didn't even get it right. So uh, I would recommend an AIO if you're going to build in this case. It looks pretty cool when it's all done, you know. Um, but you're going to see some wires. And if you're okay with that, then go for it. But that's a wrap on this video, guys. If you liked what you saw, hit the subscribe button down there. Leave me a comment or a thumbs up or something along those lines. If you didn't like what you saw, hit the thumbs down. Also, leave me a comment down below. But either way, I appreciate you watching. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you in the next one.